suspenders and a belt, my dad would say. All right. Okay, so this is strange. I never do a live class when I can't actually feel the people. And so to see you and feel you is, um, if you wanted to unmute yourself, that's okay, I think. We'll try it. If the dogs are barking and people are in the kitchen talking, it won't work. But maybe we can try that. So anyway, Hawthorne. Hawthorne, um, you know how you go through life and sometimes you get into to predicaments and you don't know how to get out of them? Has that ever happened to any of you? Yeah. All the time. Yeah, yeah. right? So Hawthorne was like that for me. I had come to a place where I just really could not see how to go forward and things were closing in on me. It felt like, I think a lot of people feel that way right now. And, and really, um, it's, a, it's about a transition and we're all in a ma major transition now. I remember as a young woman, I was really interested in being a shapeshifter. Did anyone go through that period in their life where they wanted to be a shapeshifter? <laughs> oh, that's that shamanic out there place. And so now I realize that older, wiser, maybe a little bit uh, more experienced, and what we actually have been called to do is become shift shapers. Oh, I so, like that. Yeah, yeah, here we are at this point in time that um, there is a big change going on, and really nobody knows where we're going or how it's going to turn out, but there's a lot we can do to be influential in that and so i think permaculture is a really great place to stand in that transition time because it's really about joining a dynamic living system putting ourselves back into the garden as active participants so in that odd time in my life when i was kind of in that uh, time I was really tired of people asking me, what's it good for? As an herbalist, everybody thinks that what they're supposed to know about plants if they're studying herbs is, what's it good for? And it was too small of a question because most herbs are good for so many things, we could not talk about them in such small idea ways as what is it good for only pertaining to a person's disease. So anyway, a woman asked me that. I said, I don't know. What are you good for? <laughs> Wasn't a good thing to say. But it certainly did um, stop the conversation for a moment. And I took a deep breath. And I had this feeling of something tapping on my back. And I turned around. And there was a hawthorn tree there. And the hawthorn said, Eagle Song, time for a walkabout. Mm. And so Hawthorne and I um, actually started working pretty uh, significantly together. I just really wanted to have a bigger picture of the world. I really wanted to know what are we good for? Why are we here? What are we doing this? And now we have this new thing called COVID-19. And how does our studying of nature and how we can grow our food and medicine pertain to the situation the world's faced with at the moment. It's, it's all, I think, about breaking us out into being more global thinkers. It's great to focus, there's no doubt about it, but we also have to have open perception and permeable um, boundaries so that we can actually see what's going on in the world. Learning, it's called learning. Sometimes we think we're too old to learn, but Hawthorne assured me, no, you're not, you're not too old. So there were a lot of things on that list of questions. And, and rather than waiting till the end to answer your questions, what I'd like to know is what you would like to know tonight about Hawthorne. If you could write some of those things in the chat box or just raise your hand if you have a question about something that's interesting to you or some curiosity you have about Hawthorne? What brought you here tonight? That's the first question. That's right, you can just unmute yourself and, and tell me. Hi, Katrin. What brought you here tonight? Actually, I 
attend all the permaculture meetups because I'm part of the group. I enjoy meeting people and I enjoy listening to the topics that are presented. I have a very good memory of the talk that you did about Hawthorne a year ago at the um, range. Yeah. And um, I thought it's nice to hear that again and again and again, and I can better remember that. And I was um, curious to see if there's anything new that I can learn. Some days ago, I passed by a horse on tree on the um, trail here, and I picked some flowers and I picked some leaves and I did horse on tea with that. Okay. And, um, so I'm invited to visit Ron in a couple of days. And I said, let's wait until I listened again to your presentation. So then I have a better idea what I can do with his horse on. All right. Great. All right. So let's, we will, we'll talk about the flowers because what's happening right now with Hawthorne is it's in full bloom. And the, the, this is a generative tree. She's, she's got something for us in every season. So um, Catherine says she wants to know about a friend of hers said bringing Hawthorne into the house was unlucky. That is a beautiful thing because those are cultural ideas. There, there has, I, you know, I'd be the most unlucky person in the world because I bring a lot of hawthorn into the house at this time of year to dry. So we have hawthorn spread out on sheets all over every floor of every room in our house when the season's upon us. But be, the, you know, people have all kinds of ideas about plants. And when we just take a step back and say, those are cultural ideas. Hi, Catherine. Hi. They are not necessarily imperatives. You can do it in your life and see what happens. In fact, I'm a very big believer in try it, see what happens. And, and so, so these little things guide us this way, that way. And there's all kinds of folklore around Hawthorne, like never fall asleep under a Hawthorne because the queen of the, the fairies, the queen of the May will steal you away. And sometimes that's how I feel, like I fell asleep under the hawthorn and she stole me away for 10 years. <laughs> and so she also took me to five countries to learn more about the nature of the plant and to help me get a bigger perspective of the world I live in. And I think right at the moment, there's this tendency to want to make people's world smaller and smaller. And this is like the only way we're going to be able to communicate. And I just know that isn't true. Hawthorne has really assured me there's a lot of ways we can maintain the health on the planet, in ourselves, and in the world around us. Um, this is just a temporary passage that we're moving through. So now, Eagle Song, uh, there's yeah. a question about uh, if you're going to cover the medicinal uses tonight. I think you are, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay, and so let's a, go ahead. One other question was, does Hawthorne help with grief? Oh, these are great questions. And this is exactly what I want for people to um, ask the questions that are meaningful to you so that you can go home with what you are hoping for. So uh, medicine, I'm going to just first we're going to meet a tree, one of the hawthorn trees. We have um, about 12 hawthorns here at Ravencroft. Let me just get out of the way and you can see this is our Triskeel Garden out here, go that way. And so it's four fifths of an acre that I live on. It's not a big place, it's a pretty small place. And yet we have room for 12 hawthorn trees. So right here, you can see this one and she's in full bloom. This is a Chinese hawthorn, Critagus penitifida. And the Chinese hawthorn is, um, really a great tree. It's a small tree. You can put it in a small yard and have year-round um, interest. A lot of food and medicine. So here's some of the medicine. We're just learning how to play with this thing. But we'll be talking about all kinds of medicine in the next hour. And there's one other Hawthorne that really wanted to meet you tonight. 
This is a hawthorn that I dug up on a, at a hawthorn hedge. And you can see the leaf is kind of like a mitten. And so these are very hardy trees. They are really resilient trees. And so what I think I found most interesting about the haw is that it has the capacity, the resilience, and the flexibility to actually be cut within an inch of its life. Have you ever heard that phrase? It was cut within an inch of his life. No. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I have. Yeah, it's an English, kind of an English phrase. And it comes from the hawthorn trees. When they cut the tree to lay the hedge, the tree is cut all the way through right to the cambium layer on the other side. And then that upright tree is laid over at a 45 degree angle. All the limbs become upright apical tips. And so you get an instant thick growth of plant material. Not every plant will allow itself to be cut down like that and then continue to grow. This is one of the things that really makes a tree go into the magical place of trees. How can a tree endure that kind of treatment? Not only do the hawthorns endure it, they seem to actually like it. So when you're out harvesting your flowers, you really don't have to worry about hurting the tree. These trees are incredibly tough. And you know what? We can do some toughening up as far as I'm concerned, in our world today. And, and so we have been presented with some kinds of challenges and obstacles to make sure that we get a little tougher. If I'm gonna get a little tougher, I wanna have an ally who's standing with me to do just that. The hawthorn tree is perfect for it. And she's used for hedges. This is the, the tree that most of the hedges in England are made out of. And those hedges, they have hedges in England that are over 800 years old and they're still growing. So we have to really take a step back and think about that. The old hedges followed the contours of the earth, just like in permaculture where we learn to follow the lay of the land. And they can tell how old a hedge is by how many trees in a hundred foot section. The more diverse the plant life in a hundred foot section of the hedge, the older the hedge is. So, so these hedges um, were there in the beginning and it was really about the transition between hunting and gathering and actually doing agriculture. So forests were cleared where there was land that would be able to grow grain. It was pushed back and that's what became the hedge. The edge of the new grain field is where the hawthorn wanted to live because it's a plant that loves to live in the shade and the sun, mostly in the sun to get good fruit, but it'll definitely tolerate shade. I have a, a, Crataegus, oxy, or a Crataegus monogona. It's a one seeded hawthorn, which is the main hawthorn you'll find in this area. And that one is growing right up under a maple tree. Her, their, her limbs go right up into the maple tree's limbs and it's very shady, but she's in full bloom right now. So does has not bared a lot of fruit. I think she needs more sun to get the fruit. But here they are, very wide capacity to live in many different environments. Another quality that helps us to become healthier people when we choose to use this plant as a major part of our diet. So, you know, in America, well, actually in Western herbalism, they talk about two hawthorns, hawthorn monogyna, the one seeded, the Crataegus monogyna, and Crataegus oxycantha. There are 2,718 different species of hawthorn in the world. I had no idea that Hawthorn was a genus that had so many um, actively growing relatives all around the world. That seems to be something that's pretty important right now. We have to come to a place where we have more of a global outlook. And so here this plant is presenting herself to the world and 
the medicine in the West that people think of with Hawthorne is about the heart. Everyone knows Hawthorne's good for the heart. Ah, one seated, monogyna. So, so one seed, monogyna. This is great. Botanical names. How many people like to learn botanical names? I know, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like, not really, but I have to. That's how I used to think about it. And um, once I started to understand that the names tell you a lot of information, then it got way more interesting. So let's take that name, Critagus, and break it down a little bit. What's Critagus mean? Critagus means hard wood. So this tree's limbs, it doesn't ever get very big. The trunks don't get much size to them never more than a foot or two across at the most. And it doesn't get much stature. It's not a high tree. Anywhere maybe 15, 20 feet. Occasionally you'll see one 40 feet, but that's really occasional. So they're stout, short trees, and they grow very slowly. Well, they grow to size pretty quickly, but then they stay there. And so their wood just keeps getting more and more dense. So hard wood is where crategus in Latin means hard wood, hard. So they're used for putting together chairs, a pin that holds two different parts of the chair together because it's hard but flexible. Now, isn't that a quality that you would like in your life in this day and age? A little bit of hardness with some flexibility too? Mm, so absolutely. Yeah, and so, the pin that holds the chair, the reason they use a wood that's, that's flexible and hard is because the stressors come from different directions. So you have to have something flexible to keep the chair from breaking apart. That's exactly what that quality bring, or that tree's quality brings to us. Creates flexibility when different stressors are coming from different parts. People try to get rid of stress or to make themselves calmer. I actually come at it a different direction. I want to be able to meet stress head on. I want to be able to be strong enough in my life to engage what life brings to me. I think that that's what's being asked for of us right now. So for me, Hawthorne's an amazing ally. So Critagus, Monogyna, one seeded Critagus. So in the fruits of the monogyna, there's only one seed. Eagle Song, can I ask a question? Yeah. What does one seeded mean? It only has one seed in the fruit, Pat. And can it be coppiced? The coppice, yes. What does coppice mean? Coppice means that you can actually cut the tree off at the base, totally off, and that tree will grow again. It's an excellent tree for coppicing and to keep it in a small state so that you can actually reach the fruit and the flowers for harvesting. So it works really well. Um, people are afraid to prune. This is a great tree to play with because she's so <laughs> giving. You can't hurt her. Even if you cut her down all the way to the ground, she'll come back with even more strength. So the trees are cut when they're laid in the hedge every 20, to 25 years, the hedge is relayed. And so, or actually some of them don't get laid for 50 years. So you're building a living fence that is self-maintaining for anywhere from 20 to 50 years. I have fences on all sides of my property that other people built made out of one by six cedar uh, boards. And they were all put in about 20 years ago. They're all ready to be redone. They have to be rebuilt because the wood's just rotting and falling apart. Imagine planting a hedge, a fence, that's just getting going at 20 years, not finishing up. So this is the thing. People think about all these ways that we can use the sun, but there is no better way to use the sun than photosynthesis. When we start to think about what we can grow that's green, then we're thinking about the real new green deal. It's not windmills and it's not solar panels. It's plants. 
And this tree is one of the great plants to add to any garden or any uh, boundary on a, a property that you have. And so, so those are the things. So coppicing, yeah, I actually have a lot of fun with the coppicing. I love cutting them down. It really gets you over the problem of you're going to hurt the tree. But it doesn't hurt at all to think about the five Ds, disease, deformed, or crossing. You can open the tree up so there more light and air gets in it. So while you're out there pruning for your flowers and leaf harvest, then you're definitely ready to um, do some structural architectural pruning on the tree. You can get very um, aesthetically interesting trees by the way you prune them. So keeping them small, having them fit, you don't have to cut them off at the base. You can actually shape them and form them and really create interesting trees to be part of your landscape. All right. Yeah, the other, the other name, Oxycantha, is thorn, big thorn. And this tree has thorns. Why does it have thorns? Because she's so delicious. She is so tasty, everything out there wants to eat her, including us. So she has developed a system of protection that is very sharp. And, and I tell you, some of them, thorns are three inches long. Other ones, the thorns are very small. And even some of the new hybrids, there are no thorns at all. So there's a lot of variability there. And the thorn is actually a limb. It's the new limb coming out. And I like to think of the thorn as making, cutting a way through the air for that branch to grow into. So that little pointed thorn is opening the way that that branch is going to actually grow into its new limb. So we can surely use that in our lives, that, that cutting edge thing that just actually helps to open the gateway for us as we're moving through passages <laughs> such as we're going through right now. And you know, we could get a little thornier and probably wouldn't hurt a thing. Everybody's trying to be too nice. Think about the nettle. Now there's another herb that's so amazingly uh, rich in protein and minerals. Everyone would eat it, rip it out of the ground. It doesn't have deep root system. So she developed chemical warfare. Little formic acid, keep folks away. <laughs> inject it with a hypodermic needle. These plants, people think they're just sitting there doing nothing. Oh no, they're full of constituents that help them to grow. Uh, the, the scent of the hawthorn, how many people have smelled the hawthorn in the air right now? All right, you folks need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> so when you can smell a flower or you're walking through the forest, the conifer forest, and you smell the conifers when it's a warm day and those, that smell in the air and you go, oh, this smells so good. And you know, now they call it forest bathing. Well, I was so pleased this week to actually be doing some research in um, scientific papers about Hawthorne that are coming out of Iran, because in Iran, there's like, I don't know, 50 different kinds of Hawthorns in Iran, it's in that one country. And they decided they were gonna study the differences between the different kinds of Hawthorne. In the West, we have two Hawthorns. This is reductionist thinking. It's like taking everything and reducing it. I want expansive thinking and Hawthorne is a great ally for that. So the phenols are what are the oils in the flowers, in the needles of the, the conifer trees. And those phenols are the things that actually when you breathe them in, when you're walking through the forest or now we can go hedge bathing, you're breathing in that scent, it has definite effect on your body. And they're oil-based, and so they really work through the hormonal system in the body. So what used to be people just walking through the woods because it felt good? I mean, don't you feel good when you walk through the woods? Yeah. 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 So because we live in this world that everything is a disease, and so you have to have a therapy, now walking in the woods is a therapy. Walking barefoot on the ground is a therapy. It's called grounding. You know what? This is living. 
just ordinary, simple living and remembering we're part of the garden. Not to make fun of the scientists who had to prove to themselves walking barefoot would make you a stronger, healthier person. Because sometimes that seems what they're doing is just reassuring themselves that these things are actually okay. So that's my stick about I love being in nature. I like playing with nature. I like to have my mind opening. And I am a lifelong learner. I love to learn. So how many people love to learn? Yeah, right? So I see the pink flower tree does not have a smell. You know, you're right. The pink ones don't smell as much. But the pink ones are so beautiful. I, bet I like them too. I actually really think they're really beautiful. And we have a bunch of cross trees out here in Monroe where the white ones and the pink ones have crossbred. And now we've got these trees that have these beautiful like little apple flowers. Um, they're pinky and they're dainty and they're just exquisitely fairy-like. And so Hawthorne loves the birds and the bees. All those flowers and all those phenols are really invitations to come to create more Hawthorne, right? Now, Eagle Song, what can you grow on a Hawthorne tree that is related? What are you, I'm not sure your question there, Pat. Like, uh, uh, you know how, how you can um, uh, create several different uh, types of apples on an apple uh, tree? Yeah. Okay, so grafting. Right. That we would be talking about grafting. You know, we've, we've been doing a lot of grafting experiments, and I found a hawthorn tree that lives um, in the Snoqualmie Valley. And of the five countries I've been to study in hawthorn, this one actually is really, really unique. And so we've been grafting uh, scion wood that we cut in the winter from that tree onto the native hawthorn, which is hawthorn de glossii, a Crataegus de glossii. And that's because Douglas, it's named after the plant botanist who came across the Northwest, um, whose last name was Douglas. All the de glossii plants are named after him. So those are the native ones. So there are hawthorns that are actually native here, not just introduced. And so that's, we've tried grafting hawthorn onto quince, um, but we're getting the best luck grafting uh, a certain variety onto the native tree. We get a stronger rootstock and a sturdier tree. So that's just a beginning experiment in our hawthorn project. And so if you go to hardyhawthorn.com, that's the beginning of the hawthorn project. And what I want to do is do a citizen science of the Hawthorne uh, species and varieties of America, of North America. I don't know, I'm only almost 70, so I think that's a good time to start a little project. Now, what can you do with the uh, dried flowers medicinally? Okay, now, this is where it gets fun, Pat. Thanks for that question. What can you do with the flowers? Well, let's start with the water. You can make an infusion of the flowers. I don't know if you can see this, but it's flowers that have had boiling water poured over them. One ounce of flowers to one quart of water. I use a canning jar because you can put boiling water into a canning jar and 99 times out of 100, it won't break. And then you cap it. And this is the best way to get the leaf and flower, the benefits of the leaf and flower into the body. It's the most nutritious way you can use the leaves and flowers of the hawthorn because water is able to carry the nutrients into the body better than any other, uh, what we call menstruum, any other solvent that, would, that you could use to get the benefit out of the tree and into yourself. And anyone can have it. This is a great tea to add to what we do, rotation of, of different herbs, nettles, oat straw, hawthorn, red clover. And that's the baseline of health in the practice that we teach. So we call nourishing herbal infusion. So, and they're beautiful to look at. 
just seeing these flowers. I always like to do it in glass because half the fun is looking at the beauty in the jar. So then the, this is left four to eight hours and then that's uh, strained through a strainer and squeeze out all that you can from the herb. And then we actually feed the, the what's left would be called the mark to our goats. And Hawthorne is their absolute favorite thing to eat in all the world. They love it when, when we go pick the flowers, we give them all the, the little branches that are left and they chew all those up. They like it even better when I bring them a few branches with the flowers on them. So, so that's with water. Another way you can do it, the second way is with vinegar. This is apple cider vinegar and we just Fill the jar up with the flowers, pack the flour in. So as if a fairy came and jumped in the jar, if it's packed too tight, she would bounce out. Mm -hmm. If she jumps in the jar and she sinks down too far, it's not enough herb. So when she comes and jumps in and goes, oh, that's just right. <laughs> then you know you've got the right amount of plant in that jar. Then you fill the jar up again, first with flowers, then with the apple cider vinegar. I like apple cider vinegar because I live in a place where apples are really easy to get a hold of and I can get good apple cider vinegar. And so here again, you've got this incredibly beautiful flowers. That's left, um, you can shake it up every day for the first, say, week or two, and then leave it for six uh, weeks, strain it out, but you don't have to. If you want to, you can strain it out. Um, the whole point is to use it in your cooking. Anywhere you would use or want a sour flavor, you can put the Hawthorne flour vinegar, salad dressing, marinades. And this is a bottle of, I don't know if you can see it, but see the color on the glass? That is the bioflavonoid activity. What are bioflavonoids? How many people have heard of free radicals? You heard of free radicals? Mm -hmm. Oh, I used to think I was one. <laughs> <laughs> and then they decided that free radicals were not good for the body. So they're those little things inside of you that are crashing around causing all kinds of inflammation and damage. Sort of like an elephant in a china shop. So bioflavonoids, that free radical activity happens because there's an electron missing in different molecular structures in the body. And so when that electron wants to find the other part of itself, it goes crashing around looking for it. Don't you know people like that? All they want is a hug. Bioflavonoids are the, the thing with the electron that's missing and that's what they do. They hug those molecules that are flipping around in the body causing inflammation. And so bioflavonoids really help to relieve, to relieve inflammation in the body. Right at the moment, a lot of people are starting to really see that inflammation is the main cause of dis, dis ease in the body. So anything we can use that reduces inflammation is going to be a benefit to your health. This is about as easy as it gets. And if you live in the Snoqualmie Valley or anywhere around Western Washington, you will have access, anyone has access to these trees. And actually in, in King County, Hawthorne's on the noxious weed list. Oh my gosh. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because people are so separated from what brings health. <laughs> They've gotten confused. They think they need health care but don't you really want health? <laughs> so Eagle Song, this is a good uh, segue. Uh, Catherine says, I find hawthorns that live along the Sammamish River Trail a bit overpowering in the scent. I ride my bike sort of fast to get by them as it's too much for me. Yes, 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 yes. And that's what May is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Fertility, richness, extravagance abundance <laughs> that's why the may is upon us right now it's and so <laughs> oh. 
Of course it's a bit too much. We're not used to having that much life in our life. And I remember a group of women sitting around the Hawthorne when we were doing the second picking at Ravencroft one year. And let me tell you, they got really giddy. There was laughing and singing and, you know, a lot of sexy behavior started to happen. That is the most dangerous thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Why do people be so repressive to women's sexuality? Is that the free radical part? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it is about fertility. It's about life. It's about this is why I'm done with the word sustainable. Sustainable is just not enough. And, you know, that's like a 20-year-old word. We need a new word right now. And that word is generative. We need a plant that can bring us the generative quality. Because what we know about the body now is that it actually is self-repairing. When you give it what it needs... Like when you give any plant in your garden what it needs, a place that lives, the soil it needs, the food it needs, the right amount of water, the right amount of light, doesn't that plant thrive? Yeah. It's the same with people. It's the same with people. So that just takes us. So Catherine, ride past through that area. Just don't hold your breath. Because breathing <laughs> is super go. important. On the bike, you got to right? breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that's Eagle Song, so Eagle Song, uh, Val asks, uh, I'm in the Northeast. I'm wondering if they are as abundant here. Would you know? Yes, I would know because this is something I'm so interested in. Whenever I go to a new state, I always Google Crategus, the name of the state, and species. Crategus species in Washington. Crategus species in New York. Crategus species in wherever you're going. And I am always blown away. Like Georgia, 33 kinds of, of um, Crategus in Georgia. People have no idea how much of these things are all around us all the time. I like to think of her as just about as popular as dandelion in nature. Mm. And just about as hated as dandelion <laughs> for no reason at all. Mm. I mean, why would anyone hate a dandelion? Really, come on. Because they proliferate, they're generative, and that scares people. <laughs> so, so it's a good thing because have you ever tried to get rid of dandelions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't work very well, does it? Yeah. No. Have you ever tried it? Well, you haven't probably cut down too many hawthorn trees, but you can't get rid of a hawthorn very easily either. So I'm not afraid that she's on the noxious weed list because she will outwit them every time. And what people are doing is they're starting to put bells and ribbons on the trees that they harvest and little notes that say, we harvest this tree for food and medicine. Hmm. Praise hanging from the tree. What could be better than that? It's like taking back the commons. Mm -hmm. So two questions. Uh, what does it taste like? And is it, uh, could it be toxic? Oh, that's a great question. Toxicity? None. It's as toxic as applesauce. Really, I'm not kidding. It's a great plant because it is food before anything. It's a food that is all around the planet at this latitude. It's everywhere, practically. And so, but not, you know, if you go south, it's actually in Central America, Mexico, mm -hmm. South America, but in the mountains. It's mm -hmm. considered a mountain fruit. And, and if we have time, it looks like we might have time. We go to 830, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, gosh, we could go on forever. Anybody getting full have to take a break? Okay, good. So, so, um, Toxicity is not an issue, even if you're using it when you're taking other kinds of medicine for your heart. Okay. Uh, what was the other part of that question? Oh, what does it taste like? A lot like apples. You know how different apples taste? Just different varieties of apples have different flavors and tastes. Hawthorns are the same way. So let's look at some more hawthorns. Now, this is a hawthorn. Look at the size of that fruit. Mm. Where are you? 
it's huge. This is a um, this is a Mexican. This is Crataegus mexicana. Maybe I can get it right up there where you can see it. And it has great big seeds, five of them. All right. So this is a jar of hawthorn fruit that's dried from the Snoqualmie Valley. Wow. Isn't that awesome? But look at the difference in the size. I've been trying to get a Crataegus Mexicana for the last five years and I haven't been able to get one yet, but I'm pretty excited to find one. Mm. So, so these fruits, the light changes. Oh, great. Now we have them all over the computer. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so you can see it's just a really beautiful little berries. And now, that, yeah? Is that one of the mono seed? These are different. I'm going to see there is this black one here. Is, is a, this is the one that we don't know what species it is, but it actually has five seeds. The Crataegus de Glossii, the native Crataegus generally have um, three to five seeds. It, the European ones, the one seeded one. Hmm. Maybe that's how come the Europeans are small minded. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all, I can only joke about that because I am European. Now, right? can these berries be made into uh, fabric dyes? And if so, can hmm. it set? Uh, with a, mod, a mordant, can it oh, be? Oh, that is so good. I am I am familiar with mordants. I, I understand what you're asking. And the fact that this vinegar mm. caused the color change on the jar, I am pretty convinced you could use the fruit to create a dye of some sort. Mm. I would start with an acid mordant just to okay. play around with it. And then when you find out, will you let me know? Yeah, they're, you know, mordants tend to be very toxic, so you have to be... Well, it depends on if you're using vinegar or piss or alum, or you can use toxic ones, but you don't have to. Yeah, as long as you don't eat your clothing, you're all right. Well, or you don't use toxic mordants. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You can go, and, and okay. for me, that always helps me decide what am I going to use in any given circumstance. Okay. Well, I just won't have that color if yeah, it means I yeah. have to live in a poison world. Yeah, so when I'm riding my bike, I'm picking them and attempting to make one, holding my breath and then planning to turn them into, into fabric. <laughs> oh, so you're a fabric person. You, oh, got it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, I've been around some batches of dyeing fab or uh, fibers oh. that are pretty stinky. So yeah. We don't go that way with the herbs. We try to stay away stay from Stay away the from smelling. the nasties. yeah. We yeah. like the yeah. aromas, but not the stench. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, um, so this this one, the Mexican hawthorn, it it the quality of the flesh is kind of, it's um, I like to say it's like pudding. It has a really soft um, emollient kind of a taste or a flavor, not flavor, texture. It's very pleasing to eat them raw. Mm. The little ones that we harvest around here, they're the hard. The one seeded one, there's hardly any flesh to it. The reason I like the black one that I call the golden girl, the one that we make all of our oxymel out of, she has, she's tart with a rich flavor. She's not sweet, but kind of sweet compared to other things in nature. And so this, that's why I like this one and it's very fleshy. So what other things can we do with it? We make hawthorn apple butter. We mix the hawthorn and the, and the apple butter together. And sometimes when I get done pressing out the hawthorn, I make chutney with the, I, I take out the liquid and then I use the, the fleshy part of the plant, the berries, the fruits. They're not technically berries, they're fruits. And so we make chutney with uh, ginger and different kinds of spices. So we have, a, you know, I want as much interesting flavor and taste in my life as I can, because we have a pretty simple beans and rice is the main line for the diet. And, and then on top of that, we have our herbs that we use on um, 
a regular rotating basis. So, so this is why with permaculture, this is so important because really what you're trying to do is bring into your everyday life foods that grow around you and as many different kinds of foods as you can because you need the diversity to actually get the nutrient levels that you want. People say you can't eat enough food to get the nutrient density that you need. That is so not true. We would not be a species on the planet if that was true. Do you realize they've only been putting ground up stuff in capsules for less than 50, 75, maybe 100 years? And people did quite nicely for the whatever, 300,000 years before that. One of the reasons why is because we want our fruit to be big and fat and sweet. And isn't that what people start looking like? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty obvious, folks. So one of my favorite studies is a group of people down in the Southwest decided that they wanted to see if native foods and native peoples actually went together, like some folks believe they do and I do. And they decided to go on a hundred mile hike. And the people who chose to do this hike only were going to eat their native foods that grew in that area. So 100 miles and they walked. People who started out were kind of round and obese and a lot of them had diabetes. By the time they get done with a walk, many of them did not have diabetes anymore. When they ate the food, their body was genetically used to eating. The disease left them. And what this says to me as an herbalist, and it's a big stretch for many of us, but I think it, it's going to be more and more the way we look at things, is that there really aren't that many diseases. There's just, you know, if you put diesel into a, a gas tractor, you're going to screw up the tractor, and we aren't that different. When we put the food into us that we can actually access the nutrients out of, it will build us as human beings because that's what's been building people since the beginning of time. So this little black fruited hawthorn that I like so well is um, more peeling than fruit. We got okay. things turned around. All the, almost all the antioxidants are in the fruits and vegetable skins. What we got into doing was peeling off the part that actually was the best for us. So wholeness is part of the concept that I love about living in harmony with nature, is really approaching nature wholly, not just bits and pieces, not extracting, but continually using the whole plant in our preparations. So Lorraine says that um, with the Pima Indians, and I know myself that the diabetes uh, prevalence with the Pima Indians is as much as 50%. And she says that uh, the hawthorn actually reduced that quite a bit. Do you know much about that? I don't know specifically hawthorn, but I would love it if she would send me that study because I'm always looking for um, references that I can help guide people. I do know other places where people have used hawthorn I know in my own practice where people have, have started using Hawthorne and they have gotten off high uh, blood pressure medicine. They've had the heart actually really um, begin functioning better. One of my friends has um, actually had heart um, by, bypass surgery or stents put in, which they now don't have to open you up. Um, they just put the little, it's amazing. Uh, modern medicine and the doctor said and he's been doing Hawthorne regularly for probably 20 30 years and and the other uh, herbs that we use in our rotations and the doctor said he had never seen anybody whose heart was still the, the muscle of the heart was still in excellent condition the veins of the heart were collapsing from a genetic disposition that his family had but as soon as he got the stents put in, he could breathe better, his, um, his whole countenance changed. So, yeah, so I would love that, um, Lorraine, if you could get me that 
information about that study, I'd really appreciate it. And just a lot of personal interaction with people and talking with other herbalists. We just uh, all, everybody is very convinced that of any herb you could use to help somebody with heart issues is Hawthorne. Now, what, I, what I read wasn't about uh, specifically about Hawthorne. It was just oh, okay. you, the, oh, going out in the desert, walking, finding yeah. native foods and cooking them yeah. as opposed to a lot of uh, sugars and carbohydrates. Yes, and, that's it right there. That's it. Government cheese. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Box government cheese. So if you want to read more about that, the person that you could follow would be Gary Paul Nabin. Gary Paul Nabin, his books, he's written a lot of them and every single one is worth reading. This man now, is, is it, really interested in food and, and people's health. Now, is there a difference between the potency of the leaf versus the flower and the berry? There are differences, but because nobody studies that, we don't know what they are. <laughs> and because I actually love that I live in a, a region that has a lot of diversity, I like to pick across the board and get as many different kinds of plant material as I can in all my Hawthorne medicine because I think I'm going to have a better full spectrum. Um, so, you know, drugs, they're trying to reduce it down to one specific action so they can measure it and, and dose it. Herbs are the other way around. We try to broaden the spectrum because the plants and people have been interacting for such a long time. We know the body will take what it needs and let go of what it doesn't need. Drugs override the body's wisdom. They're designed to. They're designed to go in and do a silver bullet specific thing, which sometimes is exactly what someone needs. But with, with the plants, we want that wide variety of constituents because there's going to be things that ameliorate and modify the activity of other things, and the body gets to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Got to trust the body. It's the kind of turn your head upside down. I like that one. <laughs> turn your head upside down medicine. And so we like to say Ravencroft Garden is changing the meaning of medicine. And for me, what medicine is, is it's anything that actually enhances and increases your capacity to be who you are. So herbs, foods, ways of thinking, ways of acting, feeling, all those things contribute to who we are as a human being and they enrich us or diminish us. And that is up to us to start to find the rhythm and the path in our life. And herbs are great allies for it because, you know, nobody has to tell them who they are or what they now, do. Was there, well, was there a, a particular reason why you focused on the Hawthorne uh, for yourself? Because in my practice, in the way I learn herbs, um, they come when you need them. And so a lot of ways people learn is they think that they're supposed to go out and learn something and then they will know it. I don't do it that way. Well, that way it doesn't work for me. I came to a point in my life where I really needed an ally that could help me get bigger, that could help my heart open. Um, and Hawthorne was there. I'd been picking the herb for 10 years regularly and making medicine and selling medicine and talking about it. But it wasn't until I really needed the medicine that that herb and I created a, a strong bond. So an ally, what is an ally? An ally is something that supports you but doesn't create dependence. So in plants, we think of coffee and how much, you know, you drink it for a long time, but eventually you need to have more and more and more to feel the same way. So that is a plant that is actually pushing your, um, it pushes you off center. And what happens when you don't get it is you flip back to the other side and you need, you feel kind of wasted, no energy. You push your energy level too far and then you flip back the other way. 
it's the reverse with er with plants that are sedative. If you sedate something, the rebound effect is that they're going to get hyper. So sometimes those things are really useful. Learning how to use them well is the art and craft of herbalism. Mm. So I love the plants like hawthorn, which are like down there, we just love the world and we're not going to hurt anybody. We just want to eat. We want you to eat us. And so the birds and the bees make more and more and more of it. So other ways that you can bring it into your, into your um, life, this is hawthorn flower and leaf in alcohol. I use 100 proof vodka as my minstrum. And again, we just fill the jar up with the plant material. Then we fill the bo bottle up with the, the vodka six weeks or until you get around to straining it. It's pretty simple folk medicine that actually really works really well. So, so it's a plant um, remedy that you would use more as a tonic. This one, the, the big one in water, more for nourishing. You get way more plant material in this one than you do in 10 or 15 or 20 drops of a tincture. But they both work. And so it just, it's having that nutrient density in the infusion that helps you on a daily basis because the truth is the, the, it's never over. The free radicals don't ever stop. Mm -hmm. You can reduce free radical damage in your body by reducing the sugar intake or other irritants, alcohol, too much alcohol, smoking. All those things cause inflammation in the body. So, but everyday living causes inflammation. So having foods in our diet that have that bioflavonoid activity really helps to um, hedge our bet, if we could use the word hedge in another way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. What other product? I like to call them preparations, um, kind of healing my mind from productivity or <laughs> products. And so I love to think of them as herbal preparations. Well, we've done paw butter, haw chutney, um, haw flower and leaf vinegars and extracts. Oh, all right. Haw extract with the berries. This is with the fruit of the golden girl. Then you could also do oxy mills where you take um, honey and vinegar, do an extraction into the vinegar of the fruit. Well, you could do this with the flour as well. Then you press that out. A lot of recipes tell you to put the honey and the vinegar together with the fruit. Not my way of doing it. Because why would you want to lose any of that precious honey? Mm -hmm. So I do the vinegar, strain it, and press it. And then I add honey in it to sweeten. That's called an oxy meal. It's a very old form of extraction of herbs. And it's real tasty, and it's a nice one for salad dressings. It's a great one for marinades. Uh, my mom used to do uh, vinegar and water with honey every morning as a little tonic. And she did that for years and years and years. And she did live to be 88 and was pretty darn frisky till the, the very last day. And so she, we got her on to the herbal vinegars and the oxymil, and then she just did oxymil and water because it was already a honey vinegar mix. And so um, she said she could tell the difference when she started using the herbal vinegars as to just the plain vinegar. Makes total sense because vinegar is a great way to extract minerals. How many people have chickens? Well, you can take a chicken egg and put it into vinegar, actually an egg shell won't be so messy. Um, just take the eggshell of the chicken, put that into vinegar, and let it sit in there for three or four days, stir it every day. And by the end of three or four days, the shell is totally dissolved. This is, I like to have a little real tangible proof that, that minerals dissolve in vinegar. That's a really good way to see it happen. The only thing that's left is the little membrane inside the egg that does not dissolve. 
So now if you added hawthorn flower, eggshell, you just upped your calcium intake and no pills required. So, you know, I love the chickens, <laughs> cackleberries. <laughs> I like the chickens. You know, people think that they have to have these and they have to have these. And, but the truth of it is I actually like the goats and I like the chickens. I enjoy the geese. Each one of those animals has a really different nature and character. And so do these different plants that we use. Once you get out there and you really get involved with the plants, you'll find that they all have just as many characters and interesting quirks about them as all the people that you know. <laughs> it's true. And you know, everyone's trying to do the same thing. Sometimes it makes me laugh. Why do you all want to be McDonald's when you could be just whatever flower you are in the garden? And so there's one caveat I have. If you're going to engage these wild foods, I really need to warn you up, up front that if you eat wild food on a regular basis, you will have wild thoughts. If you're not ready for that, don't do it. I like to let people know up ahead because it will change the way you think. Because think about it. When you ingest this infusion on a daily basis over a long period of time, I'm talking 20, 30 years, are you not becoming that? You will start to be able to, these are minerals that we're getting out of these plants. Mineral rich, protein rich, those are the two things that are missing out of our diet from plant world. So the minerals are crystals. And you know that that thing in your radio, well, in old time radios, you had to dial in the station to be able to get the, to hear what you wanted to hear. My theory is that these plants create a crystalline structure in us. And I've come to believe that we actually are receivers. That there's all kinds of information floating around in the airwaves and all around us. And that those things, that, that when we actually structurally make our bodies out of these plants, that we, we will begin to be able to resonate in the frequencies that they do, which means we have this whole way of being able to access information that you don't have if you don't use it. I know you just came here thinking you were gonna learn about Hawthorne. <laughs> <laughs> But I tell you, I already warned you, you're going to have wild <laughs> thoughts. We're just getting on the edge of it now. So, and Hawthorne's great. So grief, there was a, there was a, a, a question early on about grief. And, and I used to believe, um, well, I still believe in grief. Grief, sad, sadness, and the heart is the place where we feel that sadness in our body. And the lungs, real close. And so now with um, quantum biology, they're starting to understand that, number one, the heart isn't a pump. This is hard to kind of get around because we've been also told that the heart's a pump. But we were told a lot of things that didn't turn out to be true after we tested them on ourselves for several thousand years. So now what they realize is that the heart, it's like a tree with... with um, you know, there's no pump in a tree, right? There's nothing that pushes the water from the earth to the top of the fir tree or the hawthorn tree, since we're talking about hawthorns. So how does the water go up the tree? Well, it goes up the tree because the tree is pulling water up and then letting it go. It's transpiration. It brings the water from the earth up and then it goes, breeze out. It's the exhale of the tree. So it creates a vacuum and it's a vacuum. It's nothing that pulls the water up. Isn't that cool? Now they think that same thing's going on with your heart. That as you breathe and do your daily life, that, that the, there's no way that if your heart was a pump, it would go as long as a body goes. If it wasn't 
re uh, if it wasn't generative, I'm just going to get to use that favorite word again. If the heart wasn't constantly replacing itself and generating itself anew, it would just wear out if it was just a pump. But it actually, our whole entire body has the capacity to regenerate itself, to generate new cells and tissues, given that we give it the nutrients that it needs to do that. And if we can see disease fall away from people who actually set themselves to the task of eating what their bodies have eaten for eons of time in their ancestry, and those diseases just fall away, and they become clearer thinking, stronger people, I, that's my choice. I want health. They can fight about health care all they want, but I'm going for health. Yeah. And Hawthorne brought that to me. Because back to grief, when I shouted at the woman, I don't know, what are you good for? And Hawthorne said, Eagle Song, that's not her question, that's your question. That was a deep question. It took me five years of solitary confinement to actually get close to knowing what that meant. Mm -hmm. Cutting off all access to people in my life, living at home, um, I really get it when people are stuck at home. I like the Zoom. I wished I had Zoom during that period of time. Mm -hmm. I could have been singing with my sisters in Spain. Mm -hmm. And so, so how does that happen? Well, the heart, if we think about the chakras, the color green is where the heart is, right? And we bring these foods into our body that actually really help to build the heart stronger, physiologically heart stronger, then life has grief. That's the little teeny print that we don't read when we're born, that death is an equally major player in life as life itself. So I like to think of us as two-handed women. We give birth and we give death. And when I see death happening around me the way it is right now, I can only think about the, the grief that's going to come with that. But I also think about how do we make ourselves stronger? How do we create the earth to be the Garden of Eden that we know it can be as permaculturists, as people who are really dedicating ourselves to learning about what does it mean to be with earth not just taking from her. What does it mean to actually contribute back to the care and tending of the one that supplies everything we need? So I really dove deep with Hawthorne and really started taking it in every possible way. You've seen all these different ways and I haven't even shown you the wine yet. <laughs> So of course we have to make wine. It's a fruit, berry. So this wine is actually called Gosh. I don't know if it goes forward or backward on your screen. Gosh. But it's the glory of the South Hedge. Now, the reason it's the glory of the South Hedge was because the year that we actually, we have a hawthorn in the South Hedge that I planted in 1995. And in 2015, that year, that tree finally bore fruit. Mm -hmm. So 20 years we waited. Mm -hmm. You have to remember, gardening is the slowest performing art. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so I have worked at very famous restaurants with very good chefs. And very good chefs have always been used to just calling up on the telephone and getting anything they want, any time they want. And so that was a challenge for a gardener who actually, it took at least 180 days to bring some of our crops to fruition. So I would joke to myself, oh, he's in the helicopter and he has a joystick and I'm on a whale and it takes 180 days to turn the whale. And so it was hard to communicate for um, certain, around certain things. And so I really finally realized perspective is everything. 
if your perspective is you can go to the store and get cherries anytime you want to, it's a bummer when you can't. <laughs> Toilet paper is even worse. <laughs> So, so we really have to think about these things. So gosh, glory of the South Hedge was, I have a cross in the South Hedge of Hawthorne and Mount Nash. This fellow in Russia back in the 1930s decided he was gonna mix these things up. So he did Aronia and Hawthorne's, Mount Nash and Hawthorne's, and he just was crossbreeding all, all kinds of palm fruits. That's why when we talk about hawthorns, everyone says berry. But the tr truth is, they're not berries. They're palm fruits, just like apples. So, so that's a little technical thing, because once you become so wise about something, you can get technical. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyway, that year, the wine, um, we try to make a couple gallons of wine every year just to stay on top of fermenting as a practice for life. And so the wine was aronia berry, hawthorn berry, a fruit, and the fruit off of this tree that's I think called Ivan's Bell. It was, the guy's name was Ivan who did the crossbreeding. And so we, we tasted them. We took two berries of this, two fruits of that, and we would put them in our mouths and chew them up. And, and that's how we decided the, the blend to put these fruits together to, to ferment them. We wanted it just tart enough, you know, and just deep in the flavor on this side. And so we ended up with this amazing, probably the best wine I ever made in my whole life. And I made a lot of wine. So it's the glory of the South Hedge. And it only took 20 years to get the fruit. <laughs> so, so patience. I used to think I was slow because uh, it took me a long time to get things. But the truth is I was getting something that was really big. And I was frustrated because I couldn't tell people about how big it is, this place that I live, because they could only take it in small bites at a time. So I finally had to learn how to do small bites. You got a lot tonight. This is a lot of information. So does anyone have any other questions that they need answered tonight? So Eagle Song, uh, if uh, Hawthorne is number one for you, what is number two? Oh my God, that's like asking me who's my favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> the one who's in the house with me at any given time. So right now Hawthorne's my favorite because we're in full bloom harvest. Hawthorne's all over the house. Mm. Last month, last week even, it was Nettle. Before that, it was Dandelion. So it just depends, it's like square dancing. This is what I love about the, um, having a garden that every time I go outside, there's something to harvest. There's food or medicine, either in my apothecary or in the, in the garden around me. It's a small, tiny garden. All I ever wanted was a cottage garden. That when I walked out my door, then I would be in the Garden of Eden. And so we have lots of flowers too that are good for absolutely nothing. <laughs> Except they're beautiful. And that counts. That really counts. But yeah. most of them are fragrant. I really um, probably would never have a pink hawthorn because I wouldn't be able to smell it. But then Catherine might like pink hawthorns because they don't have a smell. <laughs> See? So there's something for everybody. Something for everybody. And the grief thing again, um, when I was going through that time and I was in that dark place, and dark places are where things start. Remember, the soil is dark. It's moist and dark, and that's where we get good seeds. And I was struggling with a deep question in my life. And I have a sister that I would call. She's really, really harsh. Well, she's harsh to some pe people, but I really love her a lot. And, and, I, and I believe her. She's a wise person. So I'd call her up and I said, my heart is broken because I really believed I was having a broken heart. And she said, Eagle Song, your heart can't break. Oh, I was so upset. I slammed the phone down. It took me a whole year before I call her again. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm telling you, my heart is broken. And I'm crying and I'm sad. And she says, and I'm telling you, your heart can't break. Slam the phone down again. I waited another whole year to call her. 
I called her. I said, look it, I'm telling you, my heart is broken. And she said, I know, I hear you. But I'm telling you, it can only break open. Wow. And that's the medicine of Hawthorne. Mm. Wow. We need things in our life that help us to actually endure what it means to be alive. Hawthorne is as gracious of an ally as you will ever find. She will never let you down if you just show up when she's ready. All right. It's been you. a fun evening with everybody. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. How about you? Yes, definitely. I like this. You can do the thumbs up. I can see mm -hmm. that. Any other questions? Any last minute questions? Thank you. Yes, Eagle Song, can you give us a rundown of uh, what uh, programs you're running and uh, how people can get involved with you? All right. So we have um, Ravencroft. You can access information at eaglesong gardener.com. The dash is really important. When my mom died and I went to the cemetery a lot, I noticed there were all those tombstones and it was like 1922 to 1972. And it was that place of, it told you when they came and it told you when they left. But it didn't tell you anything about them. So it's the dash that's important in your life. Eagle song dash gardener.com. And you'll see all of our offerings. We're actually learning how to use all these fancy devices that the people decided we needed to, um, to do YouTube channel things. You can go and see us on YouTube. My partner and I, Sally, um, we have a lot of fun in the garden and we have a lot of fun out in the field and in, in the apothecary. We have recipes and remedies. I wanted a whole life. And you know what? You can get one in the garden. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You no, know, Hawthorne will not overstimulate your heart. <laughs> just, just be sure to, um, to think about it. Like if you eat too much applesauce, you'll probably not feel too good. But if you eat it at a regular pace, you'll feel a lot better. Did you have a parting song? I do have a parting song. You know, let's let's see some um, action. We're gonna do the same song. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Oh yeah, take off your take off your um, microphones. Let's do it. Let's make chaos at the end of this. <laughs> because we need to know how to live in chaos, right? Unmute yourself. Ready? Here we go. Row, 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 <laughs> row your boat gently down, down the stream. The stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. dream. Row, 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 row your boat gently down the stream. Row, 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 <laughs> so this is social medicine. It's a way lot better when we can touch, touch and taste and smell each other. But for now, this is how we have to do it. So thanks again. I'm really glad you came out. I look forward to hearing your Hawthorne stories over at hardyhawthorne.com, which is where the Hawthorne Project is going to um, live for the next few years. And we'll just see how many Hawthorns we can get collected on our on our site. So we have fun, some fun over there. If you have any questions at all, you can contact me through my website and ask questions. We love them. And it, it actually gives me good ideas for what to write in the blog. <laughs> Thank you very right. much. It was a very nice and informative talk. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right. And it was totally different than last time. So it was worse to visit again. See, that's the why you have to come back and listen again, because mm -hmm. I learn more every year, and the things drop off and come back in, and so always more stories. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.
Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you. Hey Doug. Yes. How you doing? Good, good. How are how's everybody? How good. are you? Good. Yeah, you? Good. Doing well. That's great. How's married life? It's great. <laughs> 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 Better late than never. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that was very different and very interesting. She's yeah. she is um, she's she's just got a, a a role, you know. She's she can get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed that. It was great. All right. Well. I'm gonna go. Okay, so nice. I'll uh, I'll chat with Dave and then get back to you um, uh, what he wants to do. But okay. I, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Right. And uh, then we, uh, do you know if uh, some guy is gonna do the co-housing uh, or anything around co-housing? If uh, let's say that uh, we we get the release order. Well, we have we're hosting the NICA conference at the end of the month. Of this month? Um, yeah, Saturday. Let me look. Um, let's see. Like, uh, oh, Friday. Uh, why is it? Would that be the 30th then? Oh, I thought I had it in my system. May 31st. Oh, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, May thirty first, and it's going to be a it's going to be a Zoom conference from nine thirty to noon. No, nine thirty nine thirty to four, an all day conference. Do you, Do you think we should announce it on the site? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, intentional communities, but so it's not exactly permaculture, but it probably wouldn't hurt um i you definitely should think about announcing it in your um co-housing links so anyway that's all i know i mean we're still hoping that we can hold the july pizza party right right i mean we're just waiting to see what happens with covid so. yeah all right. Well, you look like you had a long day. <laughs> I did have a long day. I have a long day every day, I tell you. Being in charge of a five-year-old and a three-year-old all day well, long, it can wear well, you down. <laughs> but at least you can take them out. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I could survive if I had to stay inside all the time. Yeah. 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 My niece uh, in Singapore, they're, they're confined to their apartment. Oh. I and just, the kids are going crazy. The neighbors are um, are at their wits' end, you know, because kids are going to be kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, bad. It's it's hard. Yeah. Okay, doke. Well, right. good session, and uh, thanks for uh, discovering her. How long have you known her? I've known of her for a while, but I've really only recently gotten to know her in the last few months, but I've heard of her, you know, and she kept popping up in many ways. And then I, I met her at the, at the seed swap. And uh, that's when I said, do you want to do a program? And, and she jumped, she jumped at the chance to talk about Hawthorne. Cool. I saw on her website that she had some, um, uh, you know, she has those walks that she does, but she didn't actually uh, say tonight about, uh, you know, a specific walk. I guess she's just waiting for the signups or? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, great session. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was, that was really good. Yeah. All right, take care, you guys. Okay, Talk to you good soon. night. Good night. Right. Oh, Bye. wait a minute. Doug. Uh, yes. I Oops. do want to send her uh, $100. 
Okay. Um, so I'll send you the information on how to mail it. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay. See you.